So I just got a note in the chat that people cannot hear me. Um, so the person who asked that, please let me know if you still are unable to hear. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we are going to share our screen and then we're gonna be joined by Andy Sachs, um, who's gonna tell us a little bit about sensory processing. Michelle, I just wanted to check my audio that you can hear me. So we can hear you, we can't see you. Okay, I, I tried to start my video, but it says that the host has stopped it. Uh -huh. Okay, I will. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yay. Okay, so I apologize we're getting started a few minutes late, some technical difficulties, but we are ready to begin. And again, for those that are joining us for the first time, um, welcome to the Seaver Autism Center's uh, weekly uh, caregiver webinar. Um, we are very excited to have Andy Sachs joining us today. She's an occupational therapist. Um, who's going to be talking about sensory processing issues and strategies to use at home. Um, for those that, again, are joining us for the first day, um, Andy was with us several weeks ago at this point where she kind of shared information on how to help individuals on the spectrum wear face masks um, if they're having challenges related to sensory issues. Um, all of our past webinars and slides are on our website. So definitely check that out. Um, we are using the webinar feature today. So the chat is disabled. If you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A. Um, we cannot hear you, but if you have questions or comments, put it in the Q&A. You can ask them anonymously. And then at the end of today's talk, we will try to answer as many of the questions as possible. Um, the format is Andy is going to present to us for about 20 minutes, and then we will have a lot of time for questions. And um, we will also be uploading slides because um, Andy has tons of great ideas of exercises to be doing at home. Um, and we also have two websites for you to check out. Um, so with further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy, and I'm excited to learn more about strategies that parents can be using at home to help kids or their children um, with sensory issues. Thanks, Michelle. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be back here to discuss one of my favorite topics. But before I jump right into like the meat of the discussion, I just want to acknowledge that sensory processing is a really dense topic. Um, and there's so much new information coming out all the time. So I'll do my best here um, in this presentation to just give you the digestible, tangible pieces of information so that hopefully you can walk away feeling less intimidated by it and just more empowered uh, to use these specific strategies in your home or classroom. So I'll start by giving a brief overview of sensory processing. Sensory processing is how our nervous system receives input from our senses and turns it into an appropriate motor and behavioral response meaning that for most people, we are exposed to different sensations throughout the day, like sounds, colors, movement, touch, and our body knows exactly how it should interpret and respond to that sensory information. For others, although they're exposed to the same sensory 
um, experiences, the way that their body perceives or receives that sensory input and then responds to that information might have some sort of breakdown, which can have an impact with how they're interacting with their world. So individuals who have difficulty along that line of receiving, interpreting, and responding to sensory input are classified as having sensory processing disorder. So people with sensory processing disorder typically demonstrate some sort of maladaptive or an inappropriate response or reaction to basic sensory input because of this breakdown. And similar to other disorders, it's important to note that sensory processing disorder is also a spectrum. So meaning that not everyone with sensory processing disorder presents the same way or even responds the same way to sensory input. I just wanna make sure that we're, the slides are moving along. Michelle, do I have control over that or is somebody else? Sorry. Andy, you should have control. Um, so I'm clicking, but it's not moving. There we go. Okay. So I also wanted to touch upon something that as an OT comes up a lot. Um, and that's this idea of determining if something is sensory or behavioral. So I think it's important to note that in order to make that determination, we have to look for the underlying cause of a behavior, which is ultimately what we see. So we have to determine if it's a sensory root cause that's causing a behavior or a behavioral root cause that's causing a behavior. So ultimately, when we see a child acting out or doing something, we might miss that antecedent, that reasoning behind it. So it's up to us to become that detective to determine if they're looking to meet a sensory need or a behavioral need. So for example, if we see a child jumping around a room, we have to consider why they might be doing that. So as an OT, the first question I like to ask myself is, will this behavior go away as soon as that need is met? So well, whether it be that sensory need or the behavioral need. So typically for a person with an underlying sensory need, it's unlikely that their behavior or action will diminish right away since it takes more time for their nervous system to recover or adapt. I also like to gain insight into how a child reacts and responds to others in their environment while the behavior is present. So a child in that high state of arousal who's like escalating because of a sensory trigger will have difficulty shifting their response or behavior based on another person's reaction or response. Whereas that child who's presenting with an underlying behavioral need might be looking for a reaction and then either increase or decrease their behavior because of it. So again, I really have to emphasize that this is not a one size fits all determination or approach because the line really does get blurred between sensory and behavioral. But at the end of the day, these are just important considerations that will help us determine the path that we take in order to best support a child. So we're going to break down sensory processing a little bit more. We use terms like over-responsive and under-responsive to help define where on that sensory spectrum a person might be. So again, it's not always so clear cut since most people with sensory processing disorder do tend to shift back and forth between both. But typically an over-responsive person experiences too much sensory information filling their system at once, making it feel like it's being overloaded. So those individuals typically want to avoid sensory input altogether. So we call them our sensory avoiders, and it just means that they have a low threshold for receiving and responding to sensory input. So it, it doesn't take that much for them to feel something. On the other end of the spectrum, a person with an under-responsive sensory system requires much more stimulation in order to feel something, making them want to seek out additional sensory input. And we classify these individuals as being our sensory seekers. So they have a high threshold, meaning it takes a lot of um, sensory input in order for them to feel something. So I'm going to end up sounding like a broken record with this, but since sensory processing is a spectrum and since we experience senses in so many different ways, a person could be over-responsive to one type of sensory input and then under-responsive to another, or in the state of just like fluctuating back and forth throughout the day, which as you can imagine would be extremely taxing. So our intervention approaches have to be really individualized for everyone. And the goal would be to increase that time that they're able to produce an adaptive response to sensory stimuli. So as you likely know, we have seven senses that our body receives sensory input from. I'll mention the seven um, senses here that are on the slide. And then on the next few slides, I'll be giving specific examples of sensory motor um, strategies for each of these senses that you can use once you have determined 
where on that sensory spectrum from over-responsive or a sensory avoider to under-responsive, a sensory seeker, a person might be. So the five main senses that we all think of would be our visual sense, our auditory sense, olfactory, taste, and tactile. And these tend to be the most like self-explanatory. And then we have two additional senses that OTs love to mention. We have our vestibular sense or our sense of movement, which is detected from our inner ear, and our proprioceptive sense, which is that sensation that we get from our joints, muscles, and connective tissues. And it helps us determine where our body is in space. So some of the sensory motor strategies, um, we'll just be going over for all seven of those senses on the next few slides. So starting with our visual sense, it's important to note that visual input can be really overstimulating for a child with sensory issues since we receive so much information through our eyes. So it's important to think about ways that we can simplify the visual field for children who might be overwhelmed with visual input. So for a child who tends to be over-responsive or has a low threshold, meaning it doesn't take a lot for them to um, respond to that sensory input, they might benefit from turning off the lights or working in like a dimly lit workspace. They may also benefit from using visual blocking methods like um, repositioning their bodies to face away from distractions like a window or a door. Or if they're doing a worksheet, covering up parts of a worksheet if there's too many words or pictures. And then an under-responsive child who needs more visual stimulation, I like to use highlighted cues or markers or even um, adding in extra pictures or using vibrant colors on worksheets. So basically anything that will grab their visual attention. For auditory input, it refers to both what we hear and how we listen, and it's physiologically connected with our vestibular sense, since everything's connected through the inner ear. This is a fun sense to play around with. I like to personally play around with changing tempos of music. So maybe playing upbeat music for an under-responsive child to get them moving versus slow tempo music for an over-responsive child to like slow them down and calm them down. And with all of these sensory strategies, I find it most helpful to just draw connections to myself. So thinking about how I wanna motivate myself to exercise, I'm more likely to put on like a fast paced, upbeat song um, the same would go here, that we want to provide that faster upbeat music for a child who's under-responsive or slow down the tempo for um, a child who's over-responsive. And along with that, I also recommend listening to nature sounds. This typically has a very calming effect for everyone. So regardless on where a child might be on that sensory spectrum from over to under-responsive. Also using noise canceling headphones, um, if a child becomes overstimulated by auditory input, these are typically used for our over-responsive sensory avoiders. And then I also, this is a big one, I like to recommend giving a child with auditory sensitivity some control over sounds in their environment. So if you know that a specific sound might be triggering for them, maybe allowing them to be the one to manage it, to turn it on or off can be really helpful. So for example, if I know that a, a child really is bothered by the sound of a vacuum, maybe including them in that process or having them give me a countdown for when the vacuum should go on. Um, just giving them that control back can really be helpful during those times. So our olfactory input or our sense of smell comes through our nose and goes straight to the most primitive emotional part of the brain. So it's important to acknowledge that smell can be a really sensitive area. It's important here to just um, to take note of the environment that a person with olfactory sensitivity might be in. So for instance, just noticing that if you're having a child sit down to do work while you're cooking a really fragrant meal, um, noticing that it can be really overstimulating or distracting for them. In my practice, I do play around with some aromatherapy techniques, um, but again, this is always based on personal preference and what a child can tolerate. So you can play around with lighting candles or using calming scents. Um, I like to recommend using lavender or eucalyptus. Starting there, that's a good starting point. So taste input is perceived by our tongue, but how we interpret and experience taste is also strongly connected to our sense of smell. So our mouth is also a really important area that receives proprioceptive input, which we'll discuss on the next slide is the best type of input for having an alerting and calming effect. 
especially for our oral sensory seekers. So those kids who are like always putting things in their mouth or sucking on their shirt, um, giving them that proprioceptive input through their mouth can be really helpful. So I like to recommend children stuck on a straw or drink thick liquids like um, applesauce or yogurt through a straw. I also recommend having children eat crunchy or chewy foods or something where they have to like bite down and kind of tug it away from their back molars. Um, and that just gives a lot of input to the mouth and the jaw. Also playing around with different textures of foods and tastes can have a really alerting effect. So one of my personal favorites is using sour candy as a strategy which can help increase our level of alertness for someone with an under-responsive state. So again, I think it's just interesting to draw these connections to ourselves that I know, especially spending more time at home, that I find myself snacking more if I'm bored or tired because it helps me feel more alert. The same would go for somebody with um, sensory issues. So moving on to the tactile sense or our sense of touch, which detects light touch, deep pressure, texture, temperature, vibration, and pain. So just think of every single way we feel. Um, it's important to note that light touch can be really overstimulating for a lot of people, where, um, whereas deep touch or pressure tends to have a more calming effect. So when in doubt, I always suggest to provide deep touch, like a body squeeze or a hug versus like the child who maybe you go up and touch their arm and it kind of sets them off. That would be an example of that light touch. So I also like to explore touch by exposing children to different messy play or multi-sensory experiences. So using shaving cream, chalk, kinetic sand, or like spaghetti. Exposing children to messy play can give us a lot of insight into how, where a child might be on that spectrum from over-responsive to under-responsive with regards to uh, tactile sensory input. So it will end up being a lot of trial and error, but it can be fun to play around with those different senses. Vestibular input is that sense of movement, again, centered in our inner ear. Any type of movement will stimulate those uh, vestibular receptors, but spinning, swinging, and hanging upside down provide the most intense, longest lasting input. Vestibular inputs are really important sense, but a lot of our sensory kids can also have uh, can quickly have adverse reactions to this type of input. So it's important that you consult with an OT before implementing any intense vestibular input into your child's day-to-day. -day. Some simple strategies for vestibular input, um, specifically for our sensory seekers, I like to have them do jumping jacks or um, different yoga moves, like a downward facing dog where their head is inverted. Um, even having them doing something simple like an animal walk where again, their head is moving through space in different positions. So this is useful for those kids who we might say are like jumping all over the furniture, or maybe we describe them as being like the daredevil at the playground. Those are our sensory seekers. For our vestibular avoiders, I would recommend doing some spinning, swinging, and rolling activities. Again, being mindful that our vestibular avoiders are probably fearful of any movement and having their body leave the ground. So we really need to ease into these movements with them. As with any activity, it's important to make sure that the child is initiating the movement and it's not being done for them. Although it is important that we're there to monitor for those adverse reactions. And some examples of that, what that might be, would be nausea, um, dizziness, extended hyperactivity once the vestibular movement stops. I also recommend following up any vestibular movement with some proprioceptive input. And again, our proprioceptive input is that sensation that we gain from our joints, muscles, and connective tissue and it contributes to our overall body awareness. So it helps us determine where our body is in space. Again, proprioception tends to be the most calming and organizing, and it's the type of sensory strategy that I most frequently recommend parents to begin incorporating for their child, because it doesn't tend to have those adverse reactions like vestibular input does. I also find that it's just the, most, the easiest and like the most natural to integrate into daily life, because it can just be obtained through lifting, pushing, and pulling heavy objects. So at the end of the presentation, I put together three um, additional proprioceptive heavy work activity slides. And I often share these with families um, because they are easy to incorporate at home and they don't require you going out and purchasing um, extra equipment. Some examples would just be having a child unmake and remake a bed, taking cushions off of a couch and then putting them back on, carrying grocery bags into the house, playing a game of tug of war, maybe with a sibling using a sheet, also playing catch with a heavy ball, 
honestly, the list goes on. Um, but again, I really find that these proprioceptive strategies are the easiest to begin incorporating, often without a child knowing that they're doing like a quote unquote sensory strategy. And then the bonus is that they're usually the most effective. So in addition to our seven sensory motor strategies and considerations, I also wanted to share some commonly used language and frameworks that OTs and other professionals tend to reference when talking with children and families about self-regulation. So it's important to note that self-regulation takes a very high level of awareness and the ability to monitor one's own um, behavior and actions. So these programs were designed to help children identify how they're feeling by relating it to different terms for self-regulation. So the first language is um, from the, a program called the ALERT program, and this uses an analogy of an engine. So children are taught to label their self-regulation by saying that they have a high engine, a low engine, or a just right engine. So a high engine being that heightened state of arousal, and it's typically paired with feeling frustrated or mad. I like to point out that maybe like I start breathing heavier when I have a high engine or maybe my heart is beating faster or I'm like starting to tense up. On the other end, that low engine is that under aroused state. So maybe kids who we see are like slumped in their chair or like on the desk, um, those that are displaying an under responsive sensory um, response and they need a little extra to feel something. So we pair that with feeling tired or sluggish. And then the right, the just right engine is the optimal level. And this is typically paired with feeling alert and like able to follow directions. So it's important to note that when we discuss all of these engine levels, the high, the low, and the just right, we have to reassure children that it's totally fine and even normal to fluctuate or enter these other arousal levels. So we want to avoid stigmatizing that it's bad to be in a high engine or have a low engine. Um, and also just relating it again back to ourselves that I, I give the example that I wake up in the morning and I tend to move a lot slower and I have a low engine, but I can drink coffee or exercise to get myself back into that just right engine level. And the purpose of our whole discussion today um, and talking about sensory intervention is to increase the amount of time that a child is at that just right engine level. Another program is called the zones of regulation and I tend to use this more with my middle school and high school age students, but it can certainly be used at all ages. So this program breaks self-regulation down into four zones called the red, yellow, green, and blue zones. And similar to the ALERT program, the zones of regulation pairs those feelings and emotions with the different zones. So the green zone would be the equivalent of that just right engine. And I, again, I like to say I'm feeling focused and engaged when in that green zone. The blue zone would be the equivalent of that low engine. So again, maybe feeling tired or sluggish. And in this zone, it's recommended to do those alerting activities like doing jumping jacks, um, having a drink of water, standing up and walking around the room, anything that will sort of wake the body back up. And then we can think of the yellow zone as that in between from the green and the red zone. So kind of like on its way to feeling overstimulated or on its way to being in like a heightened state of arousal. So in the yellow zone, maybe a child's on their way to feeling frustrated or mad, but they're not at their peak until they get to that red zone. So for both yellow and red, we recommend doing more calming and organizing activities. Think of those like proprioceptive um, tasks that provide that input to the muscles and joints. So I like to have children do wall push-ups or squats, having them in quadrupeds, so on their hands and knees, doing some crawling around a room. Also just carrying heavy books or again, giving that like big hug or body squeeze. So same as with the ALERT program, it's important that we're reassuring children that it's okay to be in the blue zone, the yellow zone, or red zone, and that we're just pairing this with this language so that they become more aware of what their body feels and ways that they can get their body back into that green zone so they can stay there for longer. All right, so the the reason everyone's here today. So I purposely started this presentation by discussing sensory motor strategies because those are the backbone of any sensory diet. So in order to implement a sensory diet, there has to be some level of understanding of what type of sensory input a child might benefit from, as well as where they lie on that sensory spectrum of over to under responsive. So a sensory diet at its core is just a group of activities designed to help improve a person's attention arousal and adaptive response to sensory input. So again, increasing that amount of time that they have a just right engine or are in that green zone. 
So an ideal sensory diet is individualized. It's never a one size fits all program and it's constantly evolving, which is honestly why I'm not putting an outline of a sensory diet into this presentation. I strongly believe that providing that backbone of understanding of the sensory motor strategies and the sensory spectrum is way more useful than me saying that a child should stand up and do 10 jumping jacks at 9.15 every morning. Sensory diet should also include functional activities. So not necessarily like an obvious go do 10 push-ups, but maybe um, creating a routine for a morning exercise program or assigning chores in the afternoon, like carrying groceries or doing the vacuuming. At schools, I like to work this in by just encouraging students to carry their backpacks between classes, which can be part of a sensory diet for body organization because it gives them that proprioceptive heavy work, but it doesn't seem obviously different from what their peers are doing. And then the last point is that an ideal sensory diet meets a just right challenge, meaning that activities are a bit challenging and require effort, but they're always attainable and a child could really do them on their own. So I wanted to just review some of the major takeaways um, from this presentation. Again, I recognize that there is so much information. So starting with what I believe is the most important part, that self-regulation takes so much self-awareness, and it's important that we are also monitoring our own expectations of what a child with sensory processing disorder may or may not be able to do. Of course, I empathize with how frustrating it could be when a child just appears to like not be listening or acting out. Um, but recognizing that in that moment, a child who has sensory processing disorder is really struggling to regain a sense of balance and structure within their nervous system. So we have to assist them in finding out what the strategies are to help them develop an appropriate adaptive response to sensory input. And it does take time. So I'm going to wrap up here. Again, as I mentioned, I provided a list of additional proprioceptive um, strategies that or on the next few slides, I'll just quickly click through them um, so you can see them here. Um, I'm not going to read through them all since we did touch upon some of the strategies earlier on. And you will also have access, like Michelle said, to all of these slides um, through the SIVA website. And I will open the Q&A. Thank you so much. That was super informative. Um, we have some questions that I can read to you. Um, one is about just diagnosis since sensory processing um, is not a standalone DSM diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so you can definitely touch upon that. I mean, I think I'm sure you would say if this point, if your child is at home and having sensory issues, you don't necessarily need the DSM diagnosis. I completely agree. <laughs> strategies, but. Absolutely, I think, I mean, I, I discuss this with parents all the time that, right, the, the diagnosis is great when you, it can help you receive services, but you don't need a diagnosis to start implementing any of these strategies at home. And even, even for a child who, has no other diagnosis. I mean, I like again, I always relate this back to myself that I'm a functioning adult, but I use these strategies all the time to help myself um, create that longer lasting adaptive response. Um, somebody else wrote in that they work with a student that's extremely sluggish and tired all the time. He asked to drink water often. Could this be self regulating? Absolutely. Um, with that child, I mean, that's awesome that they're doing that. and especially if you're seeing them do that and then you see a change in their behavior afterwards, like maybe they're, they are not as sluggish or they're picking themselves up off the desk. Um, I think they're, and this is what I was trying to touch upon at the beginning, that there's definitely a fine line between what might be behavioral or sensory. So again, if you're seeing that change, great. That is most likely them self-regulating. If you see that they're using it as a way to just like avoid being in the classroom, obviously that, that would be a different approach that you would take. But for sure, I think. I think we can safely say that that would be them self-regulating. Um, somebody asked about your take on weighted vest. Loaded topic. Um, there, I recommend doing research. I mean, I, I, before doing a weighted vest, I actually like those pressure vests a little bit more um, just because the weight varies so much between, like based on how much your child weighs and um, 
my, my golden rule for anything weighted or pressurized is that it should not be worn all the time. So there are, OTs are trained in implementing wearing schedules. And the reason that those exist are because children can acclimate to having it on and then it kind of defeats the purpose. So adding in that proprioceptive input for a short period of time at increments throughout the day um, kind of prevents a child from like acclimating to having that, that weight on them. Um, so we want to keep it novel and I definitely recommend talking to an OT before implementing that on your own. And just a follow-up question um, for families whose children were getting services either at school or day programs, yep. potentially wearing vests during their therapies. Is there something that parents could be asking their OT provider in terms of how to adapt that without having to purchase like maybe an expensive item? Absolutely. There's a few, I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there are a few different brands of, um, they're like almost like the Lycra shirts that like, uh, I'm picturing like an Under Armour or like something that provides that input. Um, but I would definitely reach out to your provider um, to see what they can do to support you at home. Also just implementing those proprioceptive, those heavy work strategies, that, that's kind of the same thing. Like it's giving them that input to those muscles and joints. Um, so even if you start there, I think that that would be fine. I guess a follow up with that, um, somebody asked who should be creating a sensory diet? Teachers, parents, OT. So I, I hate that it's not such a clear cut answer, but the reality is, is that all of us are at home right now. Um, I hope that your takeaway from this presentation gives you a little bit more of that knowledge that if you're a parent, you feel empowered to be able to implement these strategies. Um, but I, I'm an OT and I work at a school and I welcome families to reach out to me. That's, that's my job. That's what I'm here to do. Um, so it, it, it can, you can put it on your, the OT, but since your, your child is at home with you, it, it kind of falls on the parents to be the one to implement it. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of everyone's, everyone's thing. <laughs> but it sounds like from what you're seeing though, there's some things that can be easily implemented with not real chance of consequence like exactly going there is no. yes and again i i hope i was clear saying this there are no consequences to doing any of these proprioceptive heavy tasks the only the only real consequence i could think of would be for any of those vestibular um input that those suggestions i gave but even there as long as you're following it up with a proprioceptive task you you should be good um someone mentioned that you suggested switching the lights on and off as a strategy for visual overload. But what if that in itself becomes a problem behavior for the child? Yeah, so what I meant by that was actually just having them work in a dimly lit space. So again, relating it back to ourselves, how we, um, we go to sleep with the lights off, right? that's like our body cooling down. So pairing that behavior, I, I mean, if you know specifically that your child would be fixated on touching the light switch, that probably would not be the strategy or the angle that I would, like the approach I would take with them. Um, I might try more of that like visual blocking method that repositioning their body away from something that's distracted, um, distracting, sorry. And yeah, I, I also, I mean, Michelle, I'm sure you could talk more to this part, but the behavioral piece, I, if that is an issue where they're fixated on it, I would really recommend not drawing any attention to it. Um, I think especially since we know that kids who are like attention seeking or seeking that reinforcement, the more that we talk about it or the more that we like tell them not to do something, they're likely to do it. Um, so kind of just ignoring that and like shifting the focus to something else. And also figuring out whether they're getting visual, imp like some kids like switching the lights and we'll get very close to it because they mm -hmm. want visual input. Okay. Um, so kind of, that's one of the tricky ones, similar to like having pieces of string where kids will go back and forth. So really figuring out the functioning of the behavior. And that's where psychologists and OTs work very closely together. Um, because if there is a sensory reason why a child is engaging in the behavior, we'll work with an OT to figure out the strategy. Um, someone wrote, my son has a lot of sensory issues, especially when it comes to dressing what might be good strategies to get him to wear clothing that is uncomfortable for him? So if you're able to engage in a discussion with him, um, I would start by like, like trying to figure out like, is it the tagging? Is it the, like the input that he gets just from it going over his eyes or his head? 
Um, I mean, this is such a broad thing that so many parents are dealing with. Um, also just playing around with different textures of clothing and like maybe trying looser fitting clothing versus the tighter fitting clothing. Um, I also, also, yeah. Sorry. From a psychologist perspective, with everything going on right now, it might not be a good time to tackle getting him to wear clothing that is uncomfortable for him um, and kind of letting him wear clothes that are comfortable right now, given the fact that there are so many other changes, um, might be just something to consider right now. And as things kind of resume and therapies are in place, um, that could be definitely something that a therapist could help you with. Um, someone wrote, what can be done for children who have tactile defensiveness and are not comfortable with haircuts? So this is a big one. Um, I've worked with a few different families on this. I've tried using social stories and then also, um, I mean, again, depends on the child and what they can tolerate, but starting with using like a, something that vibrates. So if you have like a buzzer at home, not like making them aware that you're not trimming their hair, um, but bringing that buzzer closer to their ear so they can get used to the sound of that vibration can be really helpful. And then a lot of positive reinforcement. So like pairing it um, with something that's reinforcing for them. So something that they enjoy doing. Maybe they get to watch a, a preferred iPad, like a YouTube video on their iPad while they're doing it or read a book or after they get their hair cut, they get to have a piece of candy. Um, just pairing it with those positive experiences can be really helpful. Um, someone wrote, for students who have a very difficult time focusing in the classroom and they don't have a one-to-one -one para, what can teachers do to help these students? So hopefully your teacher, um, that classroom teacher is equipped with some background knowledge um, in ways that they can simplify like the visuals in their classroom or modify worksheets for students who maybe need things like blocked out. Um, but I would definitely advocate for your child or if you're a teacher in that classroom for you to be able to differentiate, right? Like I, I work in classrooms with students of all different abilities and I sometimes I use like those block like um, dividers to set up in between students or for a specific student um, so that if he's distracted by like looking at other peers or whatever, and not in a negative way, but just to help them focus on if they're supposed to be doing a worksheet. Um, but I, I hope that the teacher in the classroom or if there's an assistant teacher in the classroom, they're able to provide that support for simplifying and differentiating. Um, we have another question. Um, a parent of a four-year-old with noon syndrome, autism and dysphagia who's nonverbal. Um, there's nothing mechanically wrong with his ability to chew and swallow. He's on a pureed diet um, due to gagging and forcing himself to choke on non-preferred foods. In addition, he often presses his fingers hard into his chin. Um, what, is there anything you would recommend? I think it's a mixture of both sensory and behavioral. Yeah, I think playing around with the different textures. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm reading the question again. I just wanna, um, so it says that he is able to mechanically chew and swallow, but he tends to gag. So, so yeah, I would play around with the different textures. Um, I mean, some OTs, I, I don't tend to do this, but I know that some OTs do recommend like using ferrotubing and like putting that in the back of the mouth um, with supervision, of course, but like that being something that a child could bite down on and like kind of tug away a little bit. Um, it doesn't, doesn't ruin their teeth, but it gives that like proprioceptive input to their jaw. But you can also do it in other ways. Like you could do like a facial massage or maybe teaching them how to like massage at their TMJ joint. Um, so there are, there are ways around it without having to, to give that input through eating different foods. And I'll also say if it sounds like it's not happening with preferred foods, it might be something that like a BCBA would be able to help with and kind of also tackle behaviorally. Um, if the individual is chewing and swallowing without gagging for preferred foods. Um, someone asked about brushing programs and what's your thoughts on brushing programs as part of a sensory diet? So I've used the brushing program. Um, the brushing program is tricky because the, the 
to my knowledge, actually, they, they kind of have discontinued like the courses on it. So the, the old school OTs are the ones that like had the training in it and kind of passed the knowledge down. But the course actually says that you should only be providing it if you've like had that firsthand mm -hmm. um, knowledge. It, it can be effective. I've seen it be um, useful, but it, it, again, kind of like the weighted vest, it takes a lot of um, carryover at home and it's a specific program. So it's designed to be used at like intervals throughout the day. And it's, it's made to be used where like you're, you're targeting the same body areas consistently and also following it up with those joint compressions. So since everyone's at home right now, I actually would forego the brushing um, and just do those like joint compressions. And I can try and kind of show you with one arm that I have to use. Um, but you always want to stabilize one end. And then imagine I have a hand at my top. I want to kind of like push so that my, my joints are like knocking together a little bit. And you do those at like all of your, um, all of the joints. Um, and that gives you that, the direct compression to all of those joints and muscles. Um, kind of following up with that, any tips for improving consistent carryover of sensory diets? It's tricky. And again, that's exactly why I didn't put an outline of a sensory diet. Um, I think the more functional the tasks are and the more like routine you can make them, the easier it is. So like that example for students who switch classes every day or like transition between different rooms at school, having them carry a backpack, the same can kind of be transitioned to the home. Um, so like setting up that time in the morning to do a 10 minute exercise routine, or maybe I, I know schools are kind of ending, um, but maybe before they sit down to do their work, you like they're doing a part of their sensory diet. And then right after they do their 30 minute Zoom call or whatever it is, they do another little activity, but making it as functional and as routine. And since you are at all at home, now you have the control over that. Um, so I guess it's really up to you to like pick and choose which strategies your child needs and which realistically you think you can carry over. Um, someone has a question. I think we can probably both tackle it. Any strategies of trying to do online live sessions with a child that just plays with the camera and seeing their own image the entire time? I would start by blocking out the image. <laughs> um, I know it's a little like disorienting when you can't, like I, we all rely on seeing ourselves. Um, but I would start by just blocking out the image and yeah, I think some social stories. I don't know, Michelle, what would you, what would you say? I was going to say, um, starting with social stories right now, there's tons of great resources. And if you go to our website, we've posted not things that we've created, but potential resources out there, but there are social stories available for students on using Zoom and kind of virtual sessions. Um, I would also maybe say like starting very short sessions. Mm -hmm. um, the child is able to sit for five minutes without playing with the camera, um, having the parent give some kind of reinforcement to the child and then slowly increasing it over time. Um, those would kind of be my behavioral um, strategies. Yeah. So in wrote, my daughter flicks her eyes upward a lot. It appears to be a stim. What's a good way to address this and help her? Um, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious if she's doing it like because the lights are bothering her, but I would, I would maybe play around with lighting. Um, I know in schools, this is an issue a lot because they tend to use that like um, intense lighting, like in hospitals, like it's, it can be really, really disorienting, um, but definitely playing out the lighting and also providing proprioceptive input. I think, I mean, she's clearly seeking something by doing it um, and it never hurts to start with that proprioceptive heavy work input to see if it makes a difference. Um, somebody, again, I, I love doing these webinars because parents and caregivers are also such great resources. Someone also posted regarding that clothing question oh, yeah. that there's a company called Independence Clothing that makes clothing for children on the spectrum that accommodates their sensitivities. Um, also, we're not related, obviously, to Target, but I know Target also has a clothing line, an adaptive clothing line um, available that has no labels and certain fabrics. Um, so there are definitely resources out there. Um, someone wrote, again, I, Andy, I don't know if you can address this, mm -hmm. any assessments that can determine if a child needs a school bus to get 
to school and home. Um, I'm not, I, I believe maybe what you're referring to is like a IEP issue. And typically that would be done by a psychologist during the formalized evaluation. Um, as psychologists, one thing that we often get is for kids that are on buses for an hour and a half, maybe they're being bused out of district. The hour and a half is just too long for a child to be on the bus, whether it's a sensory issue, behavioral issue, and often a psychologist will kind of write something um, for a family to go into their IEP meeting saying that the child cannot be on the bus for more than like a half hour or a reasonable amount of time. Um, I, I, I don't know um, if you have anything to add to that. No, I've seen it. I've, I've never heard of an OT being the one to make that decision. Um, I have seen it. There's like a few different questionnaires. I think one is called like the functional, I don't know, there's like a functional behavioral questionnaire and I've seen that as a question on it, but I, I don't know in terms of that being like a decision maker. Um, I've seen it more for like OT reporting purposes. As, as a psychologist, that's something we will make a recommendation. We've done it for kids that have asthma and just can't be on the bus or get overheated or um, might be get nauseous on the bus or have behavioral issues. Um, someone wrote, once my sensory seeker gets frustrated, he goes into a downward spiral of saying mean words. Um, any advice for techniques to get him out of the spiral? I hear you. Um, so again, I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record. It's so once they're in that spiral, it, it can be really hard to, to get out of it. Um, and that's those times where maybe we do have to be more reactive and maybe providing like two options. Like right now, um, giving them that sense of control back. So if we can provide two options where like, let's do um, this activity to help you feel better or this activity, then maybe them having that choice could eliminate that. But the whole um, purpose of this, again, is that we wanna try and avoid that downward spiral from happening. So being proactive with these sensory strategies should, you should see some of that decrease a little bit. Um, we also have somebody who works in a science museum um, and facilitates sensory activities for children. She obviously is unable to individualize, individualize activities the same way that you would um, because she might only see them once or twice. Do you have any recommendations for general sensory activities to incorporate? Um, I love this question. So the school that I work at, I think this is actually the first environment that I've been in that is really good about doing this, but um, we create sensory bins that are kind of kept in each classroom and maybe um, you can have something like that at your museum where it's just like a one-stop shop um, for each group that goes out together or whatever it is where there can be like a neck weight, um, maybe some fidgets, like a stress ball. Um, there's also, they sell these things called rollers that like um, you can, it's just like a handle and like a little ball in socket and you can like press it and it provides um, that proprioceptive input. Um, but I think that's a good idea, and it's it's great that you're thinking about that because just that environment in general can be really overstimulating. Um, I also recommend always having noise canceling headphones, um, especially if if we come across those sensory avoiders who tend to get more overstimulated. That could be really nice to give them as an option. Um, someone wrote, um, "What would you recommend for a child who really hates getting his hair washed?" I would play around with this. Um, I mean, I've seen this um, that a lot of children just don't like when the water like kind of trickles down. And that again is providing that light touch, which um, has a lot more overstimulation. So maybe playing around with having them like sit back. So like the water, once it like touches their head, doesn't trickle down their back or like putting a towel um, over their shoulders or um, maybe using one of those like, um, rash guard shirts that they can shower with. Um, obviously making sure that they still need to be hygienic, but, um, but I would start by playing around with that. And I would also say, depending on the child's age um, and developmental level, trying to get them to be part of the process, just because obviously touch feels very different, mm -hmm. um, self-initiated versus when it's somebody else. Um, so it might be uncomfortable to have somebody else washing their hair, but if they're able to do pieces of it, that might give them a sense of control. Um, just sharing some resources that our wonderful uh, participants have put in. Target the Cat and Jack brand um, is one of those developed by two moms whose children have sensory issues. 
Um, the bus form um, that Andy was mentioning, there's something called the limited time travel, and there are codes that allow you to say why your child needs those, and it has to be documented with support, supporting letter typically, I would say from a pediatrician or a psychologist. Um, Somebody had a recommendation to the uh, museum educator to make Play-Doh. Um, someone wrote, my son regularly pulls strings out of his clothes, bites his shirts, destroys iPad covers, and even bites the screen of his iPad. Any recommendations? So I would definitely start by maybe changing around or playing around with his diet um, and giving him more like crunchy or chewy foods. Um, a good starting place also, if, if you're familiar with those like go-gurt squeeze pouches, that's always like a good one because it does require them to like suck that yogurt through a straw. Um, but it does, it sounds like he's seeking that input, that proprioceptive input through his mouth. Um, so I would, I would definitely revisit those slides and, and see if you can, if there's any, any changes you can make into the way he's getting that input. So hopefully if it's done proactively, then it, that doesn't. Do you recommend using like the chewies or like the necklaces that kids could bite on or? I don't love those. I would prefer to start with like what they're eating and the, the different textures. Um, the only one that I, I have liked is like the TheraTube band again, where they like kind of bite it and like you can tug it or they can learn to tug it a little bit in the back of their mouth. Um, I, I get mixed reviews from like the, the jewelry and, and those things. I mean, they exist for a reason. So what like, by all means, try it, but it wouldn't be my first go-to. Um, there was a follow-up question for the mean words. So I think this is from the individual whose child becomes dysregulated regarding sensory and then kind of um, says mean words. Do you think there should be discipline for these words or is it not fair since they probably can't help it? I mean, do you want to take this question? I feel like this seems more of a behavioral end. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it, it, depending on what the child's working on, right? So, if the child's behavioral goals have to do with language, you might be teaching the child that they can become dysregulated, but they cannot say those words. Um, and I think we can still, again, all this is depending on your child's language level, cognitive ability, developmental ability. Um, but my suggestion would be to not intervene in the moment where they're having that downward spiral, either to let it play out, get them to a safe place. Um, if they do have sensory strategies like a body sock or something like that, and they do those and get calm, that's when I would have a conversation about the language that they use. Um, it is not helpful when they're going through that downward spiral to then give a consequence or start talking to them about their behavior because they're not gonna hear it and you're gonna end up in a power struggle. Um, someone wrote, are there assessments that determine how behind a child is in activities of daily living? I would say from a psychologist perspective, the most commonly used one is the violent adaptive behavior scale. Um, and that's gonna look at not just sensory issues or kind of activities of daily living, it's gonna look at community skills, safety skills, social skills, um, and depending on the child's age, gross motor and fine motor. Um, I, another uh, participant shared an amazing resource. Someone bought a sensory box on Amazon um, that they just typed sensory toys for special needs children and they, their granddaughter has been finding it very helpful. Um, someone wrote how to use multi-sensory strategies in the classroom. So many different ways. Um, I like to just start by, it depends what you're teaching, right? So if I'm teaching handwriting, um, which I, I do a lot as an OT, I like to like, use different, I like to touch upon their, um, that messy play technique. So maybe um, teaching them like, to write in shaving cream or by like using a chalkboard, um, just those strategies I think are the most like natural to um, integrate into the classroom. But again, also, at the school that I work at personally has like beanbag chairs in the classroom and we play around with the different seated, um, the ways to sit around. We have standing desks, so maybe allowing a child to like stand up and do their work if they're in that like under aroused, low engine, um, blue zone like feeling. Um, 
And yeah, and I think, I think also the same thing that I said for sensory diets, that the more routine it can become in the classroom. So um, I, I took a class in college that every 30 minutes we had to stand up and somebody led like a stretch or a, a movement break and it became so routine for us. And I like looked forward to that every day because after the 30 minutes, I felt like more like re-energized and ready to learn. Um, a few more questions. I see some of our viewers are signing off, um, which I totally understand. It's a very busy time in everyone's lives. If you have ideas for future webinars, um, we are picking topics based on your feedback. There are tons of fabulous resources out there right now. Um, and we don't want to kind of be redundant. We want to create webinars on topics that you feel like are needed. Um, so also use the Q&A and kind of give us some ideas on um, things that you feel like you have not been having an easy time finding resources on. And we're happy to, as you see, pull in experts from outside of our area um, to kind of talk to you about those. Um, so a few more. Um, how can occupational therapists help with feeding issues? So, I mean, it's definitely within our domain of practice. Um, and we work alongside speech and language pathologists really closely in this area. Um, I think I, I recently read somewhere, I, I personally have not done much in this area, um, but giving like strong tasting foods before trying something new. So maybe doing something that has like that sour taste or like a really like, um, a really like bold taste or flavor before introducing a new food can be really beneficial. Um, also again, playing around with textures of foods and like the chewy to crunchy, um, I guess it just, again, we have to determine why, like, like what is the underlying issue um, for that picky eater? Um, oh, sorry, I wanna add one more thing that also having children play with their food can be really helpful. So like not maybe being less strict on that demand of like eating with a fork and knife, but letting them play around with their hands um, or maybe involving them in helping in the kitchen, that can be really useful too. Um, someone wrote in, can teachers offer a sensory diet for a child without an IEP or mandated for OT? I believe that answer is yes, although I do not, I should say that I have not worked in the DOE, so I've always been in environments where OTs are like heavily used in um, the schools. I would, if there is an OT that, that works in your building, I would first, that would be my first stop. Um, just to get some strategies or maybe they could do some observations to see like what strategies would be most useful. But I think that I think that's a really nice way to like to share that responsibility and to equip you with this knowledge that it, it isn't just the OT or it isn't just the teacher that we really have to work together to figure out how that child could best function in the classroom. Um, so we have two more questions that we'll answer. Um, I do see a few people wrote in about certificates uh, to show that they were here. If you email on the slide showing up, our research coordinators that are providing the technical support, uh, Audrey and Barry, their email addresses are on uh, the slide displayed. Um, we can definitely write you a letter of um, attendance. Um, but unfortunately, this is not like a formal CME course. Um, we're doing this to just be a resource for families during this challenging time. Um, so. Um, um, when creating a sensory diet, how long do you recommend implementing it to know if the strategies work or not? So I would stick to it. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're seeing any of those adverse reactions with any of the activities where like the hyperactivity is long lasting um, or there's like a change in the way that they're responding, um, then I would definitely reach out to someone or change the activities that you're giving. Um, but I, I, I say stick it out for a while because just with anything, you're re, you're retraining the brain when you're doing these sensory activities and it does take a while to see that adjustment. Um, and also to see a child like take more control and maybe be able to self-reflect or label exactly how they're feeling in that moment. Um, and last question for the day. Um, someone wrote in that they have an eight year old and he tends to lick 
mouse, smell the TV or computer screen while he is uh, talking or on his remote Zoom sessions? Any suggestions? So I would, um, I would maybe give some like oral input before the Zoom class or maybe even during, like maybe his, if he's occupied while the Zoom session is live, um, he would be less likely to do that. So maybe if he can like have a lollipop during the class um, or something that kind of like distracts away from it. And again, Michelle, I'll say it, but I feel like maybe you would say this too, but not drawing attention to it. So we really, I think it's really important to not like stigmatize those behaviors. We want to see them decrease, but we don't want to like call it out because if they are looking for that negative reinforcement, we're kind of feeding right into it. So I think the distraction route would be better. And I would also be wondering if it's only happening in that context, the child's language level, and maybe that's his way of like either voicing confusion of what's happening or voicing that it's distressing. Um, thinking about kind of the behavioral aspect of what he's doing um, and potentially also using social stories to help him understand Zoom. Um, again, all based on his language and expressive language abilities. Um, just as a follow-up, what's your feeling about like gum chewing? I know some OTs use that for situations like this to kind of get that sensory input. I think that I'm totally fine with that. I think I often recommend it. We do that a ton um, at the school that I work in. I think that's totally acceptable. Um, and even that's, that's just a great thing that like we all do um, to some degree. So I think I'm way on board with that. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Andy, for joining us, and I definitely learned a lot. Um, thank you to all of our participants who are also joining us. Um, again, we're going to look at some of your suggestions, and based on your feedback, uh, we will uh, develop a topic for next week. Um, so tune in. So our webinars are on Thursdays from 12 to 1. If you're unable to join us, you can always find the slides and recordings on our website. So thank you again. And if you do have any questions or ideas, you can always email Audrey and Barry after this. Have a great day, everybody.